Well now, America suffering terrorism as a result of blowback for its foreign policy. Let's discuss that further now. Hizbut Tahrir, or Party of Liberation, is an Islamic political group that rejects the West and Western values. It wants to see one united Islamic state spread throughout the world. The group is active here in Australia, and its representative, Uthman Badar, joins me now in the Sky News Centre. It's nice to have you with us. Before we turn to what the events in Boston, just an overview on your view of the United United States and how you see it, how, how people who are part of your organization perceive U.S. power in the world. Well, good evening, Stan. Thanks for having me on the show. I think it's not just people in our organization. Our organization is uh, Muslim, but Muslims across the world, uh, I think it's well known that anti-American sentiment or anti-American government sentiment to be more particular uh, is rife in, in the Muslim world. And it's and it's uh, and it's right for a reason. It's right for uh, the foreign policy that that the U.S. has imposed uh, quite brutally on the Muslim world over a long period of time. Support for dictators, wars for invasion, for oil, for resources. And again, you know, we can say when I say, for example, support for dictators, it's I generalize, and it seems to be very surgical. But these are these are people, dictators, who made life hell on earth for the people on the ground in these countries, in North Africa, in the Middle East, and the U.S. was, was behind them. Accepting what, what you say there is how Muslims perceive the U.S. foreign policy, does that then justify, though, attacks like 9-11 or attacks that we saw last week in Boston? I think it explains them. Um, justifying Islam is clear that you cannot target innocent people, and uh, Muslims are also uh, quite clear on that point. But it explains it, and the problem, the problem we have is that uh, in the US and in Australia, the policy policymakers ignore that explanation entirely, and their narrative is simply radical Islam. You know, some guy sitting in a cave hates what he sees in in the American Congress, so he flies planes into buildings. It's, it's the stuff of Hollywood, um, and and this reality of the foreign policy on the ground is completely ignored. The foreign policy continues unabated, and what you do is throw money at national security, throw money at Muslims trying to buy them out and uh, you know, impose a secular uh, local version of Islam on local communities. Was it American policy though, and this is only an allegation right now of course with the Boston bombings, but that led to the two men, the Tsunayev brothers, leaving a bomb on the, on the side of the footpath that kills an eight-year-old child. Is that a reaction to American foreign policy? Well, would we have to make a number of assumptions here to, to even start the discussion? I think I'd like to emphasise that people have rushed uh, to treat uh, people who are but suspects, alleged suspects, mm. as convicted criminals. Uh, the public commentary, even the most disappointing for me, was Muslim community leaders in Boston uh, using such language for these suspects as savages, killers, and saying things like they don't deserve the normal funeral rites. Um, and this is, this is a mob mentality, this is a frenzy where you expend with presumption of innocence, but, you expend again, with due process. Again, we come back to the question though, an eight-year-old child is dead, two other people are dead, many people have been injured, the death toll could have been worse and thankfully it isn't. Is that justified by a reaction against American foreign policy? Okay, if, if we presume that the mm. case is as it's been said, and in Again, the case the evidence has been presented and, so far. And we, put, and we put this incident in the largest set of mm. attacks, yeah. attacks on Western soil, 7-7-9-11. Again, I've been very clear that attacking innocent people is unacceptable Islamically. And, and this is the point, I mean, when Muslims are asked again and again, when everything, something, something like this happens, do you condemn this? Or what do you think about this? I find that a dem almost a demeaning and insulting question, speaking generally here, because it's as if Muslims have to substantiate their very humanity every time innocents are targeted on Western soil. But if the children are being killed by Obama's drones in, in Yemen or in Pakistan, that's, well, that's different. They're just, they're just statistics that have a blip in, in the media coverage, and then we move on to other, other stories. So it's not justified. Um, I want to be clear about that, but it explains. And if you ignore that, as is being done largely in the media and, and entirely in the policy, then it's just a vicious cycle that continues. So where does your organisation, other Islamic organisations, meet the West in trying to be able to deal with these issues? Is there common ground? Well, the thing is, if we, I don't, when we talk about solutions, when we talk about the way forward, um, 
I think it's instructive to differentiate between knowing the solution and implementing it. Knowing it is easy. I think it's not rocket science that if you deal with the root causes, in time the effects will go away. Implementing is more difficult. And here there's levels. There's the political level, there's those who have power, and there's the common man and what he can do on the street, Muslims and non-Muslims alike. As far as those who hold power are concerned, you need to stop the foreign policy. And I think no one's holding our breath for that to occur. But if it doesn't, there is no solution and is, it doesn't stop. This is a, a foreign policy that has, in recent times, supported what were people movements inside Arab countries to overthrow the regimes that you said have been oppressing them. Regimes, regimes in Libya, regimes in Egypt. We're seeing the same thing playing out now in Syria. So that is also American foreign policy, isn't it? Supporting people in those countries? Yeah, sure, of course, but the foreign policy moves with its benefits. The point is that you impose, you support Mubarak, you give him so many billion dollars a year, you give him the tea, can tea, tea gas canisters that are being thrown when people uprise, and then when you see that he has to go, you say, oh, we're with the people. We're not fooled. Muslims aren't fooled because of that. And just because your policy moves wherever your benefits go, it doesn't show us anything. The point is, the policy has to change on a basis of sincerity and honesty and treating people as human beings, not as a mere source of profit. If we look at treating people as human beings, part of his but Tahrir's policy is to have a one Islamic state throughout the world, but non-Muslims would not have a role in a country like that. How is that building bridges between people to separate people on the basis of religion? Well, that's not, that's, that's not true. Non-Muslims would have a role. and in fact, certainly wouldn't be, wouldn't be able to have a leadership role in those countries. Well, these are details. Well, these are details. No, but we, we need to, we need to look at them it's in important. context. It's important detail. If you're talking about trying to bring people together, sure, sure. I mean, if you wanted to stand for parliament here, and uh, you could. If, if I was in under your idea of what, what an Islamic caliphate would be, mm. and if I was a non-Muslim, I couldn't. How is that inclusive? Well, but this is the point. Are we, are, we, are we making liberalism the standard of humanity by which every other system is to be judged? Non-Muslims under the caliphate have it far better than Muslims do under secular liberalism, where we're treated as a minority, where it, the theory is you can do this and that, but the reality on the ground is that we're just a small minority that's, that is, uh, you know, the, the foreign policies over there, locally, we're being uh, thrown money at, uh, in the media, you're demonised day in, day out. That's the reality on the ground. Theory doesn't mean anything. And in, under the caliphate system, uh, it depends on, 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 on the matter. For example, uh, non-Muslims under the caliphate can have their own courts and deal with certain individual issues by their own laws. When the issue of Sharia arises in Australia, everyone's up in arms and there's, again, it's a frenzy. Oh no, Sharia law. But, but you do choose, and, and a lot of Muslims choose to live in countries like Australia, and you're living here now and you're speaking to me on, on Australian television. Uh, again, why, if you make those choices, sure. are we not able to be inclusive and work together to deal with the issues that, that you feel are creating the environment where acts of terrorism take, take place? Well, because those who hold the positions of power are not interested in a solution, they benefit from it. And again, it's context. Muslims didn't come here because, you know, all of a sudden they decided that, you know, there's good beaches in Australia. They came here because the Muslim world was, uh, was, was brutally divided by British colonialism, dictators were imposed, and it's, it's a complete shambles. But They've I, been I think, forced I, I to think move. that the thing that people would scratch their head about here is that you are here, sure. you're choosing to live here, and you're enjoying what Australia has to offer. Um, is that, do, you, do you not enjoy that? Is that not something that you see and that other people see? And indeed, the, the, the brothers in, uh, allegedly behind the Boston bombings would see as, as the generosity of the state, that you are being allowed to live and participate in, in a country like this. I mean, is that, is that as an exception to everyone else? Are we being treated with extra... No, no, no. It's, 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 it's That's right. part so of the, the general culture. So what's culture? the problem when we contribute? I mean, am I a threat to society because I propose a different ID? I see this is the point. On the one hand, we're told that we're open society, it's debate and discussion, and when we say, OK, well, we've got a different way of life, and here it is, we're discussing it, I've got no bombs or anything, right? We're told, well, what about this? Where you come from? Go back if you oh, don't no, like no, it. No, I, I'm not, not you. No, I'm not suggesting go back. What, what, what I'm saying here is that just finally, it's the final point here. Sure. If we are looking at trying to find common ground to unite, isn't what you're saying ultimately divisive? Irrespective of what may have happened previously with foreign policy. 
it's not it's not in the past it's happening right now and this is the point it's not what we do that's divisive it's the bombs that fall that are divisive and until they don't stop we can't move forward it's not all we're doing is is presenting an alternative view an alternative way of life it's words it's it's we write articles we you know have discussions and we we demonize in return because of that so the point is very simple if those in power individuals this is the point what happens in this counterism that individuals are scapegoated and those who hold power the media the political establishment gets away with uh, with murder and and so long as that continues we can't expect a solution which we all want indeed Uthman look it's a pleasure to have you on the program it's good to be able to have these conversations I think it's important that we have these types of conversations build bridges between people rather than focus on what divides people and we see the results of that sadly far too often in Muslim countries and of course we saw it last week of course in the United States as well Uthman thank you so much for coming in thank you Sam Uthman Badar there from his book Terriya